we all want a business like Netflix or Amazon Prime. Businesses where once a customer engages with them, it becomes automatic and a part of their lifestyle from then on. But how do you build that forever transaction? I'm Robbie Kelman Baxter, and I have been studying subscription and membership models for nearly 20 years. In this podcast, my guests and I share the secrets and strategies of the membership economy. Join us for subscription stories, true tales from the trenches. Much has been written about the so-called streaming wars. The market for streaming video content is crowded with players, each with unique strengths. From Netflix's digital native early adopter status to the platform power of Apple and Amazon to the highly specific and valuable content of niche players like Crunchyroll or the History Channel, whom we recently profiled on this show. Anyone interested in subscription models can learn a lot from understanding the diverging strategies of streaming players, many of whom number among the most powerful companies in the world. Today's guest, Molly O'Connor, leads business planning and strategy for Warner Media Sales and Distribution across HBO Max, Cinemax, and Turner Networks for all U.S. distribution partners. That means she's responsible for managing the sometimes competing demands of the consumers, cable and satellite partners, and the app stores, weaving these disparate products and partners into a single cohesive strategy. In our conversation, we discuss how to think about balancing direct and indirect channels, how a subscription offering can achieve strategic and or financial objectives, and the nerdy world of subscription math. Welcome to the show, Molly. Hey, Robbie. Thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, I'm so glad you're here as well. Um, So you launched HBO Max last year, and it was a strategically important channel for Warner Media, but far from the only thing on your plate. Can you bring me back to that moment and share the story of that launch? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, and, and I know we've sort of talked about this before, but it's interesting in the streaming space with all the different service launches, because every company is really starting from a different place. In the case of Warner Media, we had a, a very loyal and engaged HBO Max subscriber base. They were used to watching HBO on linear and on demand through cable satellite or through virtual MVPs, digital channels. But they were used to paying a premium price for HBO content. And so in a lot of ways, that was a great place to start from. We had people who were willing to pay for this product that they loved. At the same time, the focus was on expanding beyond just sort of the HBO universe um, in terms of content offering, but also to really habituate the user to watch content in the app and get into sort of the app environment. So I think for us, when we were we were back at launch, there was a ton of focus just on getting you know our distribution deals done before launch, which I think is something every company goes through down to the final minute. But there was also this piece of just planning for launch with our partners and getting everyone everyone aligned on the same framework of what we were trying to achieve. It's really interesting. Like As I think about it, you have all these partners that you've had historically, the cable companies, the direct TVs and so on. And now you have these new channel partners or newer channel partners who you kind of already know through, I think, HBO Go yep. um, and HBO yep. Now. Yep. But now you have a third offering HBO Max. And so like for me, my head is spinning, right? Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> there's all these different ways that you can access the same excellent HBO content. Yep. There's a lot of people who want to be the primary way that you get access to your HBO content. Yep. And you're kind of, I think like Molly in the middle, right? Yeah. Trying to, first of all, figure out for yourself and for the organization, how do we think about these partners and how do we accommodate their concerns, right? Because they're yep. concerned that they're you're kind of bypassing them with a direct subscription. Kind of how do you how do you manage that? And then almost more importantly, how do you communicate that to your fans so yep. that they know what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to pay three times? Am I do I get it all at once? Yeah. Are they different? So you kind of have this communications challenge to your consumer audience, and you have this both st- strategic and communications challenge with all of these partners who I would imagine were very nervous because it's kind of like mm-hmm. musical chairs and the, the music goes on again and then it stops and everybody's sort of scrambling to say, well, who, who has the relationship with the customer and do I still have an important role? 
Yeah, totally. I was, I mean, just personally was pleasantly surprised. I think everyone within the space, whether it's a app store partner or cable satellite uh, distributor, everyone sort of sees and knows that, you know, obviously customers are streaming more and more as their method of consuming content. And I think a lot of our, our, our bigger MVP partners, I mean, they have their own, their own strategies for kind of leaning into that that trend and and setting themselves up for success, whether that be focusing on broadband, knowing that video packages are trending a certain way, but people are always going to need internet. And like, how do you how do you set yourself up for success to provide consumers with the content that they're looking for, but still sell the core services that they want to sell? So in a lot of ways, I think with several of the partners, it actually was was really collaborative. Um, and we, we found ways to kind of fit in with their objectives. And, you know, in some cases, they might have a, a platform like a operating system device platform that they're really trying to roll out. And so in that sense, you know, having the HBO Max app really helped them. And in other cases, they're trying to kind of push their own new services, being app based services. And so definitely kind of working through the details of what are you trying to get the user to do and making sure both sides are comfortable with that. But so far, it's gone well across the board. I think for customers, as I mentioned before, awareness was a big piece of this. And there was about a month post-launch where, frankly, for logistical and other reasons, we did still have you know HBO Now, HBO Go, and HBO Max in the market. And Can you just explain what those three are? Why you have three? <laughs> yes. So we know the good news is we no longer have three. We just have HBO Max. We did for a time have the three. And that was really... I, I think, frankly, that was just more about it, it takes time when you have legacy products that multiple different consumers use and different partners are sort of integrated with. It just takes a bit of time, I think, sometimes to kind of wind down those products and, and switch over to the new one from sort of a, a logistical perspective and also just getting certain distribution deals done can hold that process up as well. HBO Go, just for you know listeners who aren't as familiar HBO Go is the or was the companion app for HBO on cable and satellite providers. So you have HBO and Comcast, you could use your Comcast credentials to log into HBO Go, and all the HBO content was there. HBO Now was our OTT subscription product. So you know, you could just subscribe to that directly and have all the HBO content. HBO Max was coming in saying there's all the HBO content that you love, all of it's in HBO Max, but then there's so much more content from the Warner Media family, Warner Brothers Studios uh, and networks, so the theatrical studio and, and Warner Brothers TV, a lot of the kind of Turner content and, and properties, new Max originals. So, you know, HBO Max has acted as both a place to watch your HBO content digitally, similar to how HBO Go did. But it's so much more than that because there's so much extra content that's only available in the app. So, you know, ultimately we wanted to whittle it down to that one app. And it took a little bit of time, but we got there. Um, and I think it spent a lot of time on marketing and helping explain to customers what this product was, how it was different, why they should use it. And the fact that, to your point, they didn't need to spend anything else to get it. If, by being an HBO subscriber, they already had access to it. It's such a good story, I think, and really instructive for, for listeners, I think how you kind of journeyed from, okay, most of our customers are going through a third party, we're making the app as a companion, then creating something that says, but if you don't have one of those services and you just want HBO, we have an app for that. And then saying, no, this is actually part of our cohesive integrated strategy. Right. We're going to give you access to all of, you know, many of our properties, a lot of content, and we're going to give it to you in whatever way you want. Right. It's a lot of it is about your journey of experimentation with direct to consumer totally. and with having an app. So that's really fascinating. And it is messy yeah. on your way there. <laughs> so it's it's interesting in the kind of the way that you have brought your consumers along. One of the questions that comes up, and I, I actually asked Piper Rosenshine, who was a guest last season from A and E Networks and the History Channel, is when you look at the direct to consumer behavior, what have you learned about your fans that maybe you maybe you hypothesized but didn't know? Was there anything new that you learned when you when you started getting all of this rich data? One of the things that was interesting that we've sort of learned is that there's a lot of talk about how does, you know, a customer viewing in one channel sort of affect another channel. One of the things I think we've discovered through this process is that customers are comfortable watching where they're watching for for the time being. And 
you know, as long as you make yourself available in all of those places, that's what's really crucial in terms of driving engagement. And they, it, there's not necessarily as much of a cannibalistic effect as I think people think, right? You know, people always talk about the tension between, you know, theatrical windows versus streaming windows. And I, I think what we've seen, especially with like, you know, Godzilla versus Kong is that it had a, a, a monster, you know, monster performance at the, <laughs> no, yeah, no pun intended, um, <laughs> at the box office, but it did unbelievably well for us in terms of HBO Max subscription and viewership as well. And so no one really knows the answer on what true cannibalization looks like across channels. But I, I think the story is better than probably what you see written about. Um, I think customers really just want to view where they want to view. And if it's available in all those places, all boats rise. Yeah, it's so interesting because I feel like this is one of the really big concerns that organizations have, not just in the streaming world, but in news, in education, right? If we have online courses, mm -hmm. people will stop going to our universities, all of those kinds of questions. And it, over and over again, what, what I see is it deepens the relationship. Like it, it's surprising, yeah. but people have the content that they value, whether that's entertainment or professional or educational, the content that they value, they want it, like you said, where they want it, wherever they are. Yeah. And if they want it, they want it accessible. It actually deepens the relationship. And so yeah. it's not a zero sum game. And I think that's been a big surprise for a lot of organizations. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I, and I think that's where kind of going back to the, you know, the HBO Go, HBO Now, HBO Max conversation, that is, I think, one of the differences for us versus certain other companies that came from sort of a different place in the in the streaming world. Some of them started from scratch, whereas we were obviously kind of a bigger legacy company and this massive shift that you have to turn in another direction. Yeah. And because of that, there are challenges because you, you do see that there's a, a certain degree of customer inertia, not in a bad way, but people are used to consuming how they're used to consuming and that's what they want um, until they don't. And so if you try to force streaming on people who don't necessarily want it in that way, like that's not good either from a customer experience standpoint. So I think just being everywhere and, and having one cohesive strategy, which is like, you know, HBO Max, but acknowledging that you still want to make sure you're playing to customers' desires in terms of where they want to view. I was just trying to think, I, I know until recently, I'm not sure if they still do, but Netflix was still doing three DVDs out at a time. Right? <laughs> I know. it's. I love seeing that like the DVD business is still hanging on. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, well, because it's interesting because your point about habits, you know, you started our conversation by talking about how a primary goal of your work is to build habits with your consumers around accessing your content through through an app. Yep. And the challenge of having people that have habits already is that they don't have a lot of incentive to change. Right. The right. people who are usually most receptive to a new way of doing things are people who haven't established that habit yet. Yes, totally. And so I wonder, do you think about kind of your, your core audience, your longtime fans versus tomorrow's fans? The mm -hmm. people who are now just now starting to decide, you know, how am I going to, what is my system for accessing entertainment? To your point about the customers of tomorrow, I think that's where, and every company goes through this, and we have brilliant programming teams that I uh, cannot take any credit for our brilliant programming because I'm just over in distribution. But a lot of the Max Originals and some of the new content coming out and, and, and some of the Warner Media Library content reaches those other those new audiences, those younger audiences. And that is really important. And, and I know on the distribution side, like we've really had to adjust our marketing to be more expansive than what we were used to with HBO to say, hey, we've got all of this different content and use that as a, an incentive to get the person into the app. Yeah, it is yeah. a challenge. I mean, the attracting tomorrow, I think a lot of longstanding successful, as you call them, big ships uh, yeah. <laughs> have this challenge because you want to keep your current members happy. Right. But you also need to keep an eye out and say, does my, am I delivering on my promise right. to tomorrow's members, right? So if I say, I don't know, HBO has the highest quality, you know, highest production value content for your entertainment and, you know, thought provoking and, and entertainment, something like that, right? I might say, yes, that's why I love HBO. But my daughter might say, that's what I want too. 
But I don't think that HBO's, I mean, I'm not picking on HBO, but I don't know that that's where I'm going to get it. Maybe I'm going to get it from some indie something or other that I just found. So right. balancing Robbie and her daughters, uh, you know. Yeah, totally. Is it just both in terms, I think it's in, you know, we talked about the content, but it's also about the experience. Yeah. So for example, I was talking about an organization that um, is in the puzzles world and yeah. <laughs> totally different space. I love but, it. You know, there are lots of people who are puzzlers. There are people who do a crossword yeah. every morning. I love a good puzzle, especially during COVID. During COVID, we, we did a few puzzles, yeah. Not only a subscription math nerd, but a puzzle yes. nerd as well. Yes, exactly. So the puzzle world, you know, a lot of puzzles have questions that can only be answered to, by a person of a certain age. Yeah. And totally. they're also done in print with a pen or pencil. Yep. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow's puzzlers still love word puzzles but they might want different kinds of questions, different content, and also yeah. a different interface. And I think a lot of content organizations over-index on the content and under-index on the experience. Totally. So when you talk about distribution, distribution becomes really important because it's not just about managing the deals and the partnerships. It's also about thinking through that member experience and you know, how do they find you? How do they start using you? How do they build habits? Right. How do they build habits across the different platforms? All of that becomes just as much a part of the, the subscription as the content itself. Definitely. And this is, this is where the tech teams and the, the partner operations teams, there's, there's a lot of focus on not just the experience you know, within the app, so things like profiles, right? So that you can kind of speak to the different members of a household, as you mentioned, you know, Robbie and each of her daughters can have different profiles and different recommendations and different avatars even, right? But there's also this, this aspect of integrating with the platform that you're on as well, right? So to your point, like where someone's accessing is really important. And, and with our distribution partners, you know, think of like app stores in particular with their mobile devices, tablets, connected TV devices, smart TVs, figuring out and, and putting resources towards integrating with those platforms is good not just from a partner relationship standpoint, you know, because they have their priorities and objectives, but it also helps with things like content discovery. And, and I, you know, I personally feel that the critical decision-making point for a customer when it comes to what they're going to watch is at the device level, right? Every time you want to watch something, there's one step that has to happen no matter what. And it's that you have to turn on your device that you're going to watch on. And on that device or operating system platform, you're, you're going to see marketing and merchandising. Sometimes it'll be paid. Sometimes it'll be editorial, you know, editorially curated by the partner. Sometimes it'll be algorithmic. But in any case, for a lot of people, their viewing decisions are going to be influenced at that device platform level. And so it becomes even more important to make sure that your app isn't sort of its own standalone thing, but that you're integrated with that platform and that you know your marketing and merchandising strategy kind of matches up with that so that you can make sure customers at that decision point see your content get into the app to watch it and and that you know to your point really really happens initially outside of the app you know via kind of the partner platform so super super important to be ahead of the curve in those areas you really have to think from the customer's perspective yeah. and where they are and then say do all of these complicated pieces like I don't care that it's complicated for you as a consumer, right? <laughs> yeah. right? I'm like, why are they showing me, like, that's what I, my unsophisticated self, like, why are they showing me these titles? This isn't what I'm interested in. And it's because, like you said, it might be editorial, like some person decided and thought that would be good for me. It might be uh, sponsored or you yeah. know, advertisement yeah. where somebody paid and said, I don't care if Robbie doesn't like it. She's going to have to look at this ad before she gets access to whatever she's going to look for. Or the algorithm might be all wonky because- I have five people sharing my account <laughs> right. yep, with very totally. different taste, which, which kind of brings me to another, you know, it, well, two things about that. One of them is they all use it in different ways. So they're yep. turning on different devices, right? My kids are away at college or living their professional lives and, you know, or my son in his bedroom and, you know, my husband and I are watching on our big screen. Yep. Uh, so there's that, which I think you did a nice job of explaining kind of the challenges there. Second question there's five of us, you know, I'll yep. just admit it. There are five of us enjoying your fabulous content on one account. Yeah. Right. And is that okay? Um, how do you <laughs> feel about 
families sharing passwords and you know and i know it sometimes goes beyond families to um you know roommates friend groups acquaintances yeah people you met on the bus yeah exactly well so i i think the the profiles aspects of not just our app but you look at a lot of the services and the spaces is really complementary to having a household with multiple people and acknowledging like i don't think i don't think anyone in the industry expects that members of the same household even if they're not necessarily always together are sort of each have their own individual subscription yeah it's like there's two parts of this there's the logistically how do you do it which i think netflix mm-hmm. is coming up with some interesting you know sort of location you know geolocation yep. and yep preference algorithms like you know, would you really be watching this you know so that's the how but then before that even there's the the why or what is your po- policy and something i noticed with a lot of new kinds of ways of interacting early on the organizations are pretty lax with you know shared passwords and i i sort of wondered if that was about building habits and establishing footprints like let everybody have it so that they they start using our product in this way And at some Mm -hmm. point in the future, they'll subscribe, whether that's, you know, my kids establish their own households and they say, you know, this is ridiculous and I'm using my parents' account or whether it's like, you know, the Netflix is shutting the door on multiple streaming events concurrently or location-based. Yeah, I'm sure every company probably thinks about it a little bit differently. And I, I do think that there are, to your point, there are benefits to creating that loyalty and consumption of content and people sort of getting familiar with the content. I think that's partially why a lot of service services kind of in their earlier years, even up till quite recently and ourselves included had free trials. And now you've seen in the space that there's been a shift away from free trials. And I think part of that, right, was to help consumers discover and start to consume that content and become fans. So I think there's certainly a little bit of, you know, a benefit there. I think part of it too is it's, I think this gets lost in the conversation sometimes, but streaming now is, you know, looked at as such a standard, right? But we've gotten to this place in a very short number of years and the technology and and development behind apps and the different authentication and account setup and all the and billing and all the different systems, like, it's really hard and it takes a lot of resources and like our tech team does an amazing job, but I mean, there's so many competing priorities. And so I think part of it too, is just like figuring out what are the tools we can use to make sure that people are using it fairly. I think that just takes time as well, which yeah. doesn't make it seem yeah. overly sophisticated, but things are moving quickly and you're trying to, yeah. you're trying to adapt. It's a great point. I mean, both, I mean, the, the things moving quickly, I think that's important in, in two ways. One of them is that maybe Three years ago, one year ago, you wanted to be kind of lax because you were trying to build new habits. And today you're saying, um, you know what it tastes like. You don't need yeah, a free taste yeah, anymore. Yeah, <laughs> Either yeah, you want to totally. pay, like, you're not like, what is this HBO right. thing? Tell me about that, right? You get to a point. And so, and and it's changing so fast what's possible, right? It was It was almost impossible to protect yourself five years ago from people sharing passwords. And today, you know, we're much more sophisticated. So yep. speaking of sophistication, You know, I alluded to the fact that, you know, one of the things I really like about you is kind of like me, you're a subscription nerd and you love to get into the math. Yeah, guilty. Uh, My name is Ravi and I am a subscription nerd. Yes, Um, exactly. Can you tell me about your favorite, you know, kind of subscription math and, um, you know, some of the things that you've learned that you think are really helpful metrics? People listening love to know about what kind of metrics, what kind of analyses do you use? Maybe something super sophisticated and maybe something that's just really simple and basic. Yeah, no, I, I love subscription math and my team would be laughing at me right now because they, they know how much of a nerd I am about it. Like One of the reasons I call it subscription math is that I find that when people come to work in subscription for the first time, it is so different from more transactional businesses in terms of how you think about it. So One example would be like, and I'll kind of put into two different categories. There's sort of the finance, like budgeting and forecasting element of subscription. And then there's more of the analytical aspect of subscription that drives strategic decision making. Um, And they're they're kind of separate or, or not separate, but they're distinct. With like budgeting and forecasting, I think one of the things that even with members of my own team, when they started was sort of new is that with the transactional business, 
your sales, your units, they kind of fall within discrete time periods. And there's, there's not necessarily a direct effect on the next time period, right? So if you do a certain number of sales in this month, you can start again from zero in the next month, right? Or year or whatever it might be. With subscription, it's, it's a con- one continuous sort of stream, right? So if I end my year with a higher number of paid subscribers, that means I'm also starting next year with a higher number or a lower number. Um, if I pull my subscribers, if I get to a certain level of subscribers earlier in the year, that means from a fiscal year standpoint, I'm getting more months of subscription revenue because I reached that mark earlier in the year versus at the end of the year. So I think there's a lot of dependencies with subscription math and you don't just reset at zero, you know, each new, each new period. Yeah. And I think that's really sort of a, you know, an interesting piece for people. And, and then can also be complicated. Obviously, everyone's familiar, I think, or most are familiar who work in subscription with, you know, acquisition retention. But if you have a free trial, there's free trial conversion. There's many different ways of calculating churn. Like I, I've, I've gone on deep dives on the internet and sort of, you know, arguing with people on Twitter about different ways to calculate churn. So getting really nerdy. But I think it's just a, a different, but very interesting way to think about the business. It isn't truly an ongoing relationship with the customer. Then there's this strategic decision making, which looks at things a little bit differently from finance, right? Which looks at things kind of on a discrete time period basis. From an analytical standpoint, it's more about, well, what is the lifetime value of the customer? How many months are they going to be with us on average? We bring someone in, how much are we willing to pay in marketing to bring that person in? And also, how does the core product, in in my case, being content and, and engagement with that content, how does that impact retention, right? How do we kind of figure out what what viewing behaviors and types of content that they're consuming will keep them on the service the longest. So it's an incredibly complex topic, but it's it is super interesting and I think there could be like volumes of books about it and maybe one day there will be, but but yeah, love subscription math. <laughs> yeah, I do too. And a couple of things that you brought up that I just want to highlight. One of them is that it it's about the ongoing relationship with the customer yeah. Yeah. and that that changes everything. It's not transactional moment in time, end of the year, start at zero, which is good and bad, right? If you're doing well and you're planning for the long term, you really continue to reap the benefits in future years. But if you're just there for the short term, you might not see those magical numbers that come, you know, when you think about kind of old school businesses where they really push for the Q3 goal. And then you can, you can leave on a high note, right? It's like, it's totally it really gives the advantage to people who are in it for the long term. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the other thing that you brought up, well, two other things. One is that all the different parts of the organization, all the different metrics need to work together because there's so many dependencies. So you can't say we're focused on acquisition right now. If you're acquiring people who aren't going to stay, it's worthless. Right. Right. Yes. And so people have to collaborate a lot more, I think, around the same shared metrics than than mm-hmm. historically. Yes. And then definitely. one thing that you brought up about, about finance people, right, is they're used to having numbers this year. And it's sort of hard to, I mean, I wonder kind of in the kind of boardroom, are you having challenges sort of educating your investors on these metrics, these leading indicators show the health of the business? And they're going to pay off in future years. Yeah, I, I think that's where I think this kind of mismatch in a sense between how subscription works and the, the continuity of it versus how like Wall Street thinks about discrete quarters of performance. It is interesting. And, you know, on all the various earnings calls, there's definitely still pressure for public companies, right, to say, you know, hey, we reached a certain number of subscribers and each company puts kind of targets out there. And then, you know, if you don't hit them, there, there's still ramifications of that. But it, it is interesting because I think like Wall Street also is still figuring out how to, how to, how to, you know, sort of value the impact or, or really think about subscription businesses. Um, because I think it's pretty, you know, it, it is new in a lot of ways, right? It's, it's, it's as a model, it's, it's actually, it's newer, I think, than people realize. So yeah, there is kind of that tension there of trying to like, put a square peg into a round hole. But, you know, I, I think at, at the end of the day, everyone's figured out a way to make it work. And it's just to your point, what are some of the leading indicators that, that you know, are useful? So understanding how many engaged viewers there are and how many ads and new people have gotten in the door, like those are, those are always important. But yeah, it's, it's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's funny too, because 
it feels like, you know, I don't know, lip lash is the right word or what's happening at the, at the front of the train hasn't reached the back of the train yet. Mm -hmm. But, you know, on one hand, I think, for example, investors are still sort of struggling to catch up with valuation, right? And, yeah. and this whole idea of like some of the parts valuations where they say, we're going to value the subscription revenue at a multiple of seven, but we're going to, you know, manage the episodic transactional revenue at a multiple of three, because we don't think that that revenue is likely to happen in future years. So we're going to, it's not as valuable to us. And like, they're trying to figure that out. And then at totally. the other end of the train, you have your consumers who are like, enough with the subscriptions already. Like, I know yeah. everything there is yeah. to know about subscriptions and I'm exhausted. So right. I wanted to ask you if you're seeing any subscription fatigue with your end users who are like, wait, I have a subscription to, you know, I had HBO Go and HBO Now, and now I have HBO Max. And I also, you know, how do I use that with my cable, my Xfinity app? And what am yeah. I supposed to do? Do you see that or do you hear that? Yeah, I think the most common kind of discussion nowadays that like we talk about or that we hear about is is really about from an entertainment standpoint what is the what is sort of the the number of services on average that a customer will kind of level out at and what is the cost of that that combination of services and and to be honest like I don't know that the the number of services matters so much particularly like you know going back to the kind of the app platforms again they do serve as sort of a point of aggregation of, of different apps and different content. And so I think for customers, as long as they can access all the things they want in one place, that meets their needs. Now, cost and what is like sort of the ceiling on how much price they're willing to pay, I think is definitely still an important question. And I think that, number one, it remains to be seen. I think every company probably has a certain idea in mind of what, you know, what they think customers may be willing to pay. But I also think that this is where, like you see with a lot of these different services, starting to experiment with different pricing strategies in order to make it more affordable for the customer. So using ad-supported services, for example, so that you can bring the price down. If someone's watching an ad-supported service for, for free, they're not going to cancel that service, right? It's free. So just playing around with the different the different price points and offerings and, and making sure that I think at the end of the day, what's important is that, you know, you want to be a must have service. And ideally you'd like to be a service where customers, yes, they have to turn on their device and figure out what they're going to watch. But in many cases, they just bypass that and go straight to your app, right? Because they know it has everything they need. That's like the, I feel like the North star. So there, I think there is subscription fatigue for sure. But I, I also think it's more about the customer experience and how you Make sure everything's easily accessible and in one place for them and, and at the right price as opposed to kind of the number of services in and of itself. The organization that has the best experience is probably gonna win. Which yeah, is which no, is totally. really interesting. Yeah. Totally. I think that's I think that's crucial because there's so much good content. And so, you know, you really can't sleep on the customer experience side of it. Like it, it's just so it's so important, um, which is why you see so much investment in it. Do you have time for a speed round? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Okay. First subscription you ever had? Oh my gosh. Wow. True speed round. I think it actually, I think it actually may have been Netflix. Yeah. Oh. We got the DVDs when I was, when I was younger. Yeah. <laughs> Three DVDs at a time. What's your favorite subscription today, excluding any that you work with? I, I really like FabFitFun. That's like, so, you know, I just, I, I don't know. I, I love it. It gives, it brings me joy. I, I can't help myself. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> okay. Um, your favorite movie? Favorite movie. Um, I'm a history nerd. I love the movie Lincoln, Steven Spielberg, Daniel Day-Lewis are amazing. Love that movie. What would your team say is your superpower? Um, <laughs> I think they would say that I know how to take complicated topics and like understand them in such a way that I can explain them in super clear language. Like they say, you know, explain it to a kindergartner. Um, I think that's my superpower, I'd say. <laughs> And um, a time when you felt like a member, like you belonged. I do think, and I, I know you just recently did this podcast with your friend from Nike, but I do think Nike does a great job of this. They do make me feel like a member and I've ended up buying more from them and kind of participating more in, in sort of their membership, so to speak. I think they do a really nice job. And last question, advice for people listening who are trying to build a, a direct relationship with their customer in a complex world? Yeah, I, I think just at the end of the day, like you really have to think about things from the customer standpoint. 
the beauty of that is that we're all customers, we're all consumers. So think about, I obviously come from the entertainment lens, but like when you turn on your TV, like what are the most basic steps you're going through, right? Or if you're subscribing to some sort of consumer goods uh, service, like how do you consume products? Like always coming back to the customer experience, I think is critical for making the right decisions. Beautiful. Molly, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. This was fantastic. Thank you. This was super fun. We'll have to do it again sometime. That was Warner Media's Molly O'Connor. For more about Molly, Warner Media, and HBO Max, go to warnermedia.com. And for more about subscription stories, as well as a transcript of my conversation with Molly, go to robbiekelmanbaxter.com slash podcast. Also, if you like what you heard, please go over to Apple Podcasts or Apple iTunes and leave a review. Mention this episode if you especially enjoyed it. We read all the reviews because we want your feedback. Thank you for your support and thanks for listening to Subscription Stories. Subscription Stories.